Now, uh, let's start the remaining part of skin cancer. Yesterday, we talked about basal cell carcinoma, the most common skin cancer all over the world. The remaining two are squamous cell carcinoma of the skin, also known as cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma and malignant melanoma, or you can simply call it melanoma. So let's do those uh, today. Now see that. Cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma is the second most common skin cancer after basal cell carcinoma. So this is an important MCQ question. You should not forget how the question is asked. They may give you the different options and ask which one is the most common skin cancer. The answer is basal cell carcinoma. And after that is squamous cell. Now the common etiology regarding the squamous cell carcinoma are again, ultraviolet radiation exposure or prolonged exposure to sunlight. That is the most important risk factor. Apart from that, immunosuppressive conditions, any condition which can lead to chronic or prolonged immunosuppression can also lead to squamous cell carcinoma. Remember, we all already talked about that. Any other type of cancers are also quite common in immunosuppressive condition. Exposure to ionizing radiation or chemical carcinogen, is another one, like for example, in the hospital, you know, somebody may be exposed to the X-ray, to the CT scan. CT scan also has, you know, X-ray in a higher dose. So they can, uh, you know, suffer from this uh, condition and human papilloma virus infection is definite risk factor these days. Remember the different cancers caused by human papilloma virus. Yes. Uh, can you name some of the cancer caused by human papilloma virus infection? Yes. What are those? So, uh, uh, cervical cancer. Penile good. cancer. Good. Very good. Very nice. Any Anything else? Yes, your answer is correct. Anything else? Lungs, urinary bladder. Mm -hmm. Now, now see there, uh, I'll give you an important clue and uh, you'll never forget. Now, absolutely, the answers, uh, you know, the students are giving is uh, correct. The most important one is cervical cancer. Never forget that in case of female carcinoma of the cervix, the most important cause or risk factor is human papilloma virus infection. So if it can cause cancer in female, it can cause cancer in male also, like penile cancer or carcinoma of penis is also caused by human papilloma virus infection. Even carcinoma of vulva and vagina is associated with that. And now let's go upwards, you know, the upper part of the body, head and neck cancer, Remember this, head and neck cancers are also caused by human papilloma virus infection, like oropharyngeal cancer, laryngeal cancer, and even esophageal cancer. It is connected with HPV infection. So this is, you know, the newer, uh, you know, advances in, in surgery or medicine has, you know, told us that, you know, different researches has been done. What is the cause of that particular cancer? And they found that the DNA of human papilloma virus is found, you know, in, this, in those cells uh, which are carcinogenic. Now, among the ultraviolet ray exposure, the chronic type of ultraviolet radiation or rays exposure is very, very important here, just like basal cell carcinoma. And that can happen because of tanning bed, okay? Medical ultraviolet treatment. Remember, uh, uh, sometimes we use Soralin and ultraviolet A radiation treatment for different types of diseases. One of the diseases is psoriasis. So if that is done for a long time, okay, and chronically in a patient, who knows, probably some of them may convert into you know, squamous cell carcinoma cases. Okay, so that is the point. Some of the epidemiological evidences regarding the cancers are, see there, geographical proximity to the equator, history of precancerous lesion or prior skin cancer, older age, and male sex predispose an individual to the development of cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma. So these are some of the points from epidemiology. There are certain other well-known markers of ultraviolet radiation vulnerability, and they are fair skin people, okay, where there is decreased amount of melanin. 
okay because melanin is the pigment uh, which is responsible for the color of the skin so if somebody is a very fair skin individual probably that person is having a decrease amount of melanin and we all know melanin has a shielding effect on the nucleus of those keratinocyte so without that there is a high chance of mutation inside the keratinocyte and that mutation is responsible for cancer development albinism now what is albinism yes what is that a complete uh, absence, absence of melanin complete yeah. absence of melanin exactly very good all of you are correct this is absence of the melanin because melanin cannot be synthesized there you know the melanocytes are present but melanin cannot be synthesized so this is autosomal recessive type of disorder which runs in the family and this albinism a patient you know we can identify from a distance they look very fair skinned or white there is no pigmentation uh, usually it is a generalized type of loss of pigmentation there and there are very very high chance of development of skin cancer any type of skin cancer can be developed there let's move on now there are certain other conditions okay like uh, these see there xeroderma pigmentosum epidermodysplasia verruciformis and dyskeratosis congenita or congenital they can also develop into cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma we uh, talked about xeroderma pigmentosum a little bit yesterday okay uh, a little bit of knowledge is necessary here xeroderma xero means dry derma is the skin pigmentosum is different type of pigmentation okay so this is how we identify those type of people but at the same time you know they have some other complication also like the cornea is opacified and because of the opacification of cornea they can be blind as well they can have certain neurological abnormality also and the basic problem here is dna repair is abnormal the dna can be damaged because of different etiology but our body can repair back that dna if that you know mechanism is abnormal then dna it can be mutated a gene can be mutated you know uh, easily which can uh, result in different type of cancer development especially the skin cancers epidermodysplasia verruciformis is another autosomal recessive disorder where there is a numerous viral warts present in the body the most severe type of viral warts disease and dyskeratosis congenita is another congenital condition okay of the skin where there is abnormal pigmentation of the skin okay there is abnormal abnormality of the hair and nails as well as bone marrow suppression this is a condition where bone marrow is suppressed or bone marrow is abnormal so that there will be pancytopenia okay uh, it can also lead to aplastic anemia you can remember like that now one of the very important knowledge here sometimes uh, cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma may arise at a site of chronic inflammation and this type of squamous cell carcinoma is known as marzolin's ulcer okay very important mcq question from the surgical exam marzolin's ulcer now what are those situation where there is chronic ulceration presence in the skin it can be anything like burn scar or thermal injury scar any chronic scar in the skin because of some wound in the past okay any any chronic type of scar venous ulcer remember venous ulcer is the result of a varicose vein varicose vein is quite common in the lower limbs and sometimes that varicose vein may rupture and can lead to ulcer formation this is known as venous ulcer in a long run uh, it can convert into marzolin ulcer and then lymphedema as well this is you know a prolonged uh, collection of the lymph there okay that area is a uh, swollen all the time it may ulcerate and if that becomes chronic later on uh, it may convert into squamous cell carcinoma and we call that marzolin ulcer even chronic osteomyelitis ulcer can convert into 
uh, squamous cell carcinoma, and we still call that margillage ulcer. So this is a very generalized term. Do not pinpoint margillage ulcer with a particular etiology, okay? Any type of chronic ulceration or scar can convert into squamous cell carcinoma later on. That is known as margillage ulcer. Let's move on. Now, after knowing the etiology, let's talk about how the patient present. What are the clinical presentations there? What are the symptoms and signs? The common symptoms of squamous cell carcinoma of the skin are, see this, there is a history of a non-healing ulcer or abnormal growth in a sun-exposed area. So a bit similar to basal cell carcinoma. But this ulcer is much more bigger than basal cell carcinoma and it has got few important points there, okay? We'll, we are going to talk about that. And another important point is, it can metastasize to the nearby lymph node very commonly, where in basal cell carcinoma, uh, that virtually never occurs. Features that suggest peripheral nerve involvement by the tumor, like local pain, numbness, twitching, or weakness of the muscle, and with the cutaneous uh, squamous cell carcinoma of the face, visual changes should be asked because it has a property of local invasion. It's a malignant condition, isn't it? So if it invades the nerve, these all are the uh, important features which can happen to the patient. So we need to ask that in the history. Sometimes the nearby uh, organs or the tissues can be directly uh, you know, affected. For example, uh, there is a cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma of the face, which may you know, uh, invade the orbit and the visual change may happen after that. Look at this picture here. This is a, you know, a good picture of a squamous cell carcinoma. See this? Look at the ulcer here. This is the base of the ulcer. There are some necrotic tissue at the base. And this is the age or margin of the ulcer. See this? This age is elevated from the surface. Okay. This is a very, very important point of ulcer of squamous cell carcinoma. And there is a bit of bleeding as well. This is bleeding. Now, during the physical examination of cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma, the first thing is the site where it is more common. What is the commonest site? Now, see here. Approximately 70% of all cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma occur on the head and neck, and most frequently involve the lower lip, lower lip, external ear, and periauricular region of forehead and even the scalp. So just remember, head and neck is the most common site, just like basal cell carcinoma. That is also more common in head and neck. The squamous cell carcinoma of the skin also commonly occurs there. Among them, Okay, the lower eyelid is a very common sight. Now, when we examine that, uh, you know, uh, uh, abnormal area, we need to note the size also, how big it is. Rough measurement should always be mentioned. It is never the accurate one, you know, uh, it is a rough one. Then what is the character of that lesion? Does it look smooth or nodular? What about the vascularity? Is there any active bleeding going on? Sometimes on the you know nearby area there is excessive uh, you know new blood vessels formation, which is known as telangiectasia. They are dilated as well. And what is the color? Okay, especially the slough which is present on the base of the ulcer. What is the color of that? What is the color of the you know overall ulcer age? We need to note that presence of ulceration. The important point here is heaped up age. Hip top edge means overhanging edge with irregular border. This is one of the very, very important point of cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma because of rapid growth, you know, the, the uh, edge or the margin is overhanging from the ulcer site. This is known as a hip top edge. Okay, let's move on. Now, let's uh, see some of the picture here. Now, please focus, all of you, please focus on the first one. See this? So this is the eye. Here is the upper eyelid. Here is the 
lower eyelid okay lower eyelid now see this at this side okay the lower eyelid there is one uh, uh, two abnormal site i can see one small nodule here and another one is here okay this this nodule is already a bit ulcerated i can see small ulcer here in this area so this is a very early presentation of uh, squamous cell carcinoma and it can be diagnosed by biopsy only now, another one this is already ulcerated and it is very difficult for us to tell whether this is basal cell uh, carcinoma or squamous cell carcinoma okay but basal cell carcinoma usually doesn't look like this yesterday we talked about that you know it has different type of uh, morphology but still the doubt may be there and the only way to distinguish your doubt is histopathology you have to take the biopsy from this site and send to the pathology lab now let me ask you one simple question from surgery if you are going to take the biopsy which is the site from where you take the biopsy yes which is the site anyone from the center is it from the center or from some other part of the ulcer that is the question yes so from the early so take from the sides so from the periphery sorry, we can take okay so different types of answers are coming please uh, listen carefully this is a very very important question your teacher may ask this is a practical type of information you don't take the biopsy from the center of the ulcer never because at the center there is only necrotic tissue this is a slough this is necrotic tissue you don't see anything there okay always take biopsy from the edge of the ulcer edge probably from here or from here so if you take the edge you need to take a normal you know part also for example this part is normal so take a bit of normal tissue and the abnormal one so that the pathologist can compare yes these tissues are normal and these are abnormal so you know he can give you a good report and this is the active part of the ulcer isn't it so edge of the ulcer is the right answer here never from the center now clinically the lesions of squamous cell carcinoma you know in situ range from a scaly pink patch to a thin keratotic papule or plaque similar to actinic keratosis yesterday we we saw some of the picture of actinic keratosis this is a pre malignant condition later on it may convert into squamous cell carcinoma so bowen's disease is the another term for squamous cell carcinoma in situ okay it almost looks like actinic keratosis there is no frank ulcer at this stage but it may look a scaly type of lesion there or it may look like a pink patch on the surface of the skin or uh, there is a bit of you know uh, excessive flecking formation there you know so any type of presentation may be there and we all know bowen's disease is a term we use for uh, squamous cell carcinoma in situ this is a general term wherever squamous cell carcinoma occurs if it has not crossed the basement membrane we can use the term bowen's disease now see this picture here there is no ulcer this is not ulcer this is a plaque this is known as plaque you see this irregular type of border okay a little bit of a pink type of appearance okay there is a bit of white appearance also in one small area so we we never say this is a bowen's disease by the look a lot of differential diagnosis can be considered here who knows it may be a fungal infection there okay it may be a psoriatic patch see this it it a uh, small area may look like a bit of you know silver colored scale and there there also a little bit so who knows patient may have applied some emollients here before coming to you so the typical crusting of the psoriasis may not be seen so what i'm saying here is whenever this type of picture is shown to you uh, rather than picking only one diagnosis you know it is always better to tell two or three different names there and then the another answer should be i want to take biopsy from this area and confirm what is there or i need to do some other investigation another part of physical examination is a finding of tumor metastasis 
where this tumor or cancer can go as a metastasis. Remember, 70% of the time, the most common site is head and neck area. So from there, it can go to pre-auricular lymph node, submandibular lymph node, or upper deep cervical group of lymph nodes. So we need to palpate them all the time. Regional metastasis occur in only two to six percent of cases of cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma. So it is also not very common, just two to six percent. But in basal cell carcinoma, it virtually never occurs. So two to six percent in comparison to basal cell carcinoma is still a good percentage. In general, metastasis from cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma of the forehead, temple area, eyelid, cheek, and ear is to the parotid group of nodes and metastasis from the lips and perioral region is primarily to the submental and submaxillary or upper deep cervical group of lymph node. So you don't need to remember uh, it in this much detail. What you should know is palpate all the uh, you know cervical group of lymph nodes and uh, I have discussed that before with you. You know you just uh, go on the back side of the patient use your both hand okay and you can quickly palpate all the lymph node you know at one time okay just run your finger here and there and you can feel them now there are certain uh, you know hallmarks point of malignant lymph node so how how you know if a lymph node is palpable and that is malignant type of lymph node how you know what are the characteristic point yes if there is a hard, this is malignant. Hard, and hard and Very good. Excellent. And yes. Yes, yes, please. I'm listening. Yes. So, also immobile. Now, if we mobility loss, then we consider this is invaded to some area. Exactly. So, so many different points are coming from the student side. So, very good. So, let me list those, okay? So, the first thing is they are hard. They are very hard type of lymph node. Very good. Second, okay, they may not be mobile. They are immobile. They are immobile. This immobility of the lymph node is because of local invasion, okay? It may be fixed onto that area. It may be fixed to the overlying skin or underlying muscle or other type of tissue. That is another important point, hard and immobile, okay? And they are discrete. Discrete means we can feel them individually. They are not usually matted. Matted lymph node is a feature of tuberculosis. So they are usually not matted and they are painless, okay? They are painless. But there are certain, you know, uh, exceptional points there. If that lymph node is uh, compressing the nearby nerve, then uh, there may be pain at the site. But that lymph node itself may be painless. So these are some of the very important point of malignant lymph node. You should never forget. Absolutely favorite questions of the examiner. Now, look at this picture here, all of you. Look at this area here. Okay, there is a mass we can see. The mass can be visible from outside, and there is a bit of erythematous area as well. And there is a small another area also present here. See this a swelling here. Okay, and the arrow is showing some abnormality on the on the ear also, the pinna of the ear. Okay, this is called helix of the ear. So preauricular and helical scar, which are shown by the black arrow from prior excision of the growth are noted in a patient who presented with cervical metastasis, which is shown by the white arrow here, from an occult cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma. Occult. It is not the, that very big type of lesion or uh, uh, ulcer formation, but this small type of growth can lead to big you know, cervical lymph node. That's why it is known as occult type of cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma. And we can prove this only by biopsy. Otherwise, it will be difficult. Now, what we see in that biopsy now, see here, this is what histopathology of squamous cell carcinoma looks like. 
it has not crossed the basement membrane. So, so the term squamous cell carcinoma in situ is used here. See there. Okay, these all you know are the cancer cells here. Okay, these are probably inflammatory cells. Now, just have a look here. These are the cancer cells, and see there, they have already invaded the basement membrane, and you know they are already present in the you know dermal area. Okay, so uh, this is the squamous cell carcinoma proper means the invasive type of squamous cell carcinoma. It is no more squamous cell carcinoma in C2. And along with these, you know, cancer cells, there is a marked inflammatory cell response as well. So these dotted areas, you know, a little bit bigger blue type of cells are the malignant cell and the smaller, uh, you know, a darker type of cells are the inflammatory one. Now, the final part is the treatment. So how the cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma is treated? One of the way is electrodesiccation and curators. Electrodesiccation means destruction of the tumor by electro electric cautery. It can be used to treat low risk squamous cell carcinoma on the trunk and extremities. This procedure destroys the tumor and the surrounding margin of clinically unaffected tissue via the cauterization and scraping of the area with the curate. That's why it is known as curatage after electrodesiccation, destruction of that area with electrical current. The process is repeated several times until the surgeon is quite confident that there is nothing left. Now, another way is a surgical excision itself. Okay. Surgical excision itself. See this, the generally accepted five-year cure rate for primary tumor treated with standard surgical excision is 92%. This is a very good one. This is the excellent, you know, five-year survival rate or cure rate here. And this rate drops to 77% for recurrent cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma. Probably metastasis has already occurred, so the, the chance is dropped. Third one is a radiation therapy, okay, is a radiation therapy, you see there. This radiation therapy uh, is used as a primary treatment for cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma, especially in those people who are not fit for surgery or who are unable to undergo surgical excision. So radiation therapy is reserved for them. Now, chemotherapy, can also be used here. So what are those chemotherapeutic, uh, you know, uh, substance or agents? These are 5-fluorouracil, okay, 5-fluorouracil, you already know the name, and epidermal growth factor receptor inhibitors. Uh, one of the example we have is cetuximab, okay, cetuximab. This is epidermal growth factor receptor inhibitor. So uh, they uh, can be combined together. So they are also known as adjuvant chemotherapy. Adjuvant means along with other uh, type of standard treatment, these chemotherapeutic agents are added there. You know that's why they are called adjuvant chemotherapy. They are not the uh, you know single or sole type of treatment. Systemic chemotherapy can also be used, and the drugs are cisplatinum and carboplatinum, 5-fluorouracil, and the taxins. These are different examples of anti-cancer drug. Now, what about the prognosis? Okay, see there. So I already told you in the in yesterday's discussion in the beginning, basal cell carcinoma and cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma have wonderful prognosis. They usually do not kill the patient. And this is the evidence for you. The association of tumor depth with survival rate has been reported as follows: less than two millimeter, 95% survival rate. From two to nine millimeter, eighty percent survival rate. Larger than nine nine millimeter, sixty five percent survival rate. This uh, two to nine millimeter and larger than nine millimeter are already invasive type of cancer. Though, okay, they are invasive. Still, the prognosis is not that very poor. Okay, not that very poor because we have studied some of the cancer has even five to ten percent survival rate. You know, 
So in comparison to them, this is still very good. Now, the third one, a third important type of skin cancer we have is melanoma or malignant melanoma, whatever we want to say. Okay, both of those are correct term. This melanoma, they are highly malignant tumor. They originate from melanocyte. And these melanocytes are originated from the neural crest cells. Very important question from the exam point of view. Neural crest cells develop into melanocyte. Never forget that. And these neural crest cells, they migrate to the epidermal area, even uvea, meninges, and different other ectodermal mucosa, and they differentiate into melanocyte. So melanocytes are present in all these areas. That's the point. They are present, of course, in the epidermis. And where exactly in the epidermis, which layer of the epidermis the melanocytes are present? Yes, which layer? Anyone? Epidermis. It is in epiderm epidermis, but which layer of the epidermis? Remember, there are four or five layers of the epidermis. Basal layer. Basal, basal layer. Exactly. It is, it is basal layer. It is stratum, basal, or basal layer. Okay, don't forget that. Because that, that picture should come to your mind now. Uh, at the stratum basal, there are different melanocytes present. And they are very long, you know, branching type of pattern. And, and those, those branches are reaching uh, upwards. So these are melanocytes there, okay? Uvia, this is present in our eyeball. Uvia is a middle coat of the eyeball. So there is also presence of melanocyte. So virtually melano melanoma can develop in the uvia as well. They're also present in the meninges and other ectodermal mucosa. Uh, like they are not skin, but they are having uh, you know, stratified squamous epithelium. Now, can you tell me where are those area where stratified squamous epithelium is present in our body apart from the skin? What are those area? Esophagus. Esophagus. Good. Oral external genitalia. Anal canal. Good. Anal canal. Very nice. So see there. So many of the students uh, already know that. Excellent. This is another good question to ask the student. Remember, apart from the skin, oral cavity, okay, is comprising of stratified squamous epithelium, the non-keratinized type. Pharynx, okay, oropharynx even laryngopharynx and the esophagus, all of them, they, they are having stratified squamous epithelium because this is the tougher type of epithelium. We swallow different types of food. Some are cold, some are hot, some are burning. So we need tougher type of epithelium to withstand that injury or damage. And that is stratified squamous type of epithelium. Apart from that, lower part of the anal canal is having uh, stratified squamous epithelium, lower one third of the vagina is having the same type of epithelium. And then in our body, because of metaplasia, okay, th then other epithelium may also convert into stratified squamous type. So those are a pathological example. So you don't need to tell that now, but if the examiner wants, uh, please be prepared. The melanocyte, which reside in the skin and produce a protective melanin, are contained within the best cell layer of the epidermis. So, already talked about. Now, let's talk about how, how the melanoma grow, you know, which is the direction they grow. The melanoma have two growth phases, radial and vertical. Radial means sideways. And vertical means, you know, it is going deeper and deeper. And of course, vertical is much more dangerous because uh, it will quickly go into dermis. And in the dermis, we have lymphatics and the blood vessels. And once it invade them, it can go anywhere. Now, see here. During the radial uh, growth phase, the malignant cells grow in a radial fashion in the epidermis, means sideways. You understand like that? With time, most melanoma progress to the vertical growth phase in which the malignant cell invade the dermis and develop the ability to metastasize. Now, clinically, 
the lesions are classified according to their depth, which are given as follows. Uh, thin means one millimeter or less depth. Moderate means one to four millimeter depth. And thick means more than four millimeter depth. And of course, no need to explain. Moderate uh, and thicker one is much more dangerous than the thin one. Now, what, is the, what are the histological types of melanoma? Okay. What are the types actually? These different types of melanoma are superficial spreading type of melanoma, superficial spreading type of melanoma, which is the most common type. So important MCQ question from the dermatology you know, exam. Nodular melanoma, okay, node-like appearance, lentigo maligna melanoma, acral lentiginous melanoma, and mucosal lentiginous melanoma. Now, lentiginous is a small plaque-like appearance, okay, a freckle-like appearance. It is not nodule or uh, other type of appearance. It is a small freckle, okay or small plaque-like appearance. This is called lentigous, lentiginous or lentiginous appearance. So lentigo maligna, acral means the acral part of our body, okay? Means the distal part of the limb, they are called acral. And mucosal, you all know. So these are the different types. Now, what are the site other than the skin melanoma can develop? So you can, uh, answer that uh, safely now, or uh, there may be eyes, any other mucosa where the melanocytes are present, the whole GI tract, genitourinary tract, and even the leptomeninges, okay, uh, because melanocytes are present there also. So, uh, uh, theoretically, any of these areas can uh, have melanoma, but practically, you know, it is much more common on the skin and then very rarely uh, to these areas. Metastatic melanoma with an unknown primary site may be found in the lymph node only. So some of the patient may present like that, you know, they, they do not have the primary, uh, you know, visible or obvious site, but they may present with a big lymph node enlargement. Now let's talk about the staging of uh, melanoma. There are two types of staging, okay, or classification system according to the staging we use. First is called Clark staging, and second is called Breslow staging or Breslow classification. Now, what are these? Okay, see here. The Clark staging has a level one to level five. Level one means all tumor cells are above the basement membrane. So this is just like a melanoma in C2. Level two, tumor extends into the papillary dermis. Papillary dermis is the upper part of the dermis. Level three, tumor extends to the interface between the papillary and reticular dermis. Interface means right in the middle. And level four, tumor extends between the bundle of collagen of reticular dermis. And then level five, tumor invasion of the subcutaneous tissue, even below the dermis. So it is going straight vertically downwards. Breslow classification is uh, depending on the measurement of the thickness. It is like 0.75 mm or less, 0.76 to 1.5 mm, 1.51 to 4 mm, and 4 mm or more. You see that from uh, less uh, amount of thickness to more amount of thickness, Breslow classification. Let's move on. Now, see that. What is the etiology of melanoma? It's like, you know, uh, squamous cell carcinoma of the skin and basal cell carcinoma, malignant melanoma also has certain etiological factor. So what are those? Certain lesions are considered to be precursor lesions of melanoma. These precursor lesions of melanoma are these different type of nevi, okay, or nevus. Nevi is a plural one, nevus is a singular one. So they may be common acquired nevi, a nevus, dysplastic nevus, congenital nevus, and cellular blue nevus. Different types are there. So all of them are considered 
precursor lesion of melanoma. That means any of these nevus may convert or transform into melanoma later on, but some are more commonly transformed than the other. Regarding the genetic factors, okay, there are many genes which are implicated. So uh, some genetic predisposition may exist here. And just like squamous cell carcinoma and the basal cell carcinoma, ultraviolet radiation play a very, very important role here. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about that. Ultraviolet A and ultraviolet B, both are potentially carcinogenic. Ultraviolet uh, A radiation has a longer wavelength than ultraviolet B radiation. Just compare the wavelength here, 320 to 400 nanometer uh, to 290 to 320. This is ultraviolet B and UVA is a longer one. So both are carcinogenic. Ultraviolet radiation appears to be an effective inducer of melanoma through many mechanisms, including suppression of the immune system of the skin, induction of melanocyte cell division, free radical production, and damage of melanocyte DNA. So this is the mechanism by which ultraviolet radiation can lead to melanoma. Okay, these are the pathogenetic factor. Remember, damage of melanocyte DNA is one of the major factor here. Now, another important point regarding the ultraviolet radiation of the sun is sunburn. Okay, sunburn. Now, sometimes what happens? People predispose or expose themselves, I should say. People are exposing themselves to the sunburn. Okay, very increased amount of sun exposure would be there within a short duration. This is called sunburn, and this is a very, very important risk factor for uh, melanoma development. In comparison, basal cell carcinoma and squamous cell, cell carcinoma are cumulative exposure to the sunlight. Cumulative means chronic exposure over a long duration. Whereas malignant melanoma is a extensive type of exposure over a shorter duration. This is the difference. Now see there, acute, intense, and intermittent blistering type of sunburn, especially on areas of the body that only occasionally receive sun exposure are the greatest risk factor for the development of sun exposure induced melanoma. Like people who often go to beaches, okay, they, they expose their body, which otherwise is you know, hidden by the cloth and very extensive type of exposure that is an important risk factor for melanoma development. Let's move on. Some other you know, risk factors which greatly elevate the chances of development of melanoma are changing mole. Changing mole means changing in the size of the mole. The mole is getting bigger than before. The color of the mole is changing. We'll, we are going to talk about that a bit later. You know, This is an important point. Dysplastic nevi in familial melanoma and more than 50 nevi, okay, which are two millimeter or greater in diameter. So the total number of nevi are more than 50 and the size are greater than two millimeter. That is a definite risk factor for the development of melanoma. Now, moderately elevated risk factor for cutaneous melanoma include one family member with melanoma, previous history of melanoma, which was treated and congenital nevus. Okay. The nevus, which is already there from the time of birth, they are also, you know, uh, a re in a important risk factor for the development of future melanoma. Now with this, let's talk about what is the clinical presentation of malignant melanoma. Regarding the history, we have to take in detail the family history. Ask every member of the family, how is their health? Are they having similar type of problem or not? Approximately 10% of all patients with melanoma have a family history of melanoma. So very, very important question in the history taking. Also a family history of irregular and prominent mole is important, okay, prominent mole. And if the size is irregular, if the age is irregular, I should say, that is an important risk factor. Ask about the past history 
regarding any previous history of melanoma from the patient okay then uh, there is a definite uh, you know risk of developing a second melanoma in the future so ask about that in detail now ask about the history of sun exposure now what type of sun exposure extensive blistering type of sun exposure over a short duration is an important risk factor for melanoma the capacity to tan is also important because individuals who can easily are less likely to develop a melanoma than those who burn easily okay so burning blistering type of sun exposure is an important risk factor than those people who can tolerate that type of sun exposure if they do not develop uh, you know damage to the skin even uh, after exposing to the very bright type of sunlight rather they tan their skin they have less chance of developing a melanoma rather than uh, if the skin is damaged like a blister formation as a result of sunburn they have more chance of developing regarding the mole any history of change in size color or symmetry of the mole is a very very important point in the history taking and these are the features which suggest that the mole is changing into melanoma also elicit any history or family history of multiple nevi syndrome okay consider that point in the history taking now a very important part of uh, melanoma topic is the skin examination okay, very favorite question of the examiner not only the dermatology examiner you know, even surgical examiner may ask you this question so please pay attention regarding the skin examination we have to consider different things assess the total number of nevi present on the patient's skin because if there are more than 50 nevi okay there is a high chance of development of melanoma in the future another is the size if they are more than 2 mm okay there is more chance attempt to differentiate between typical and atypical lesion and these are the points which will tell us the a b c d for differentiating early melanoma from the benign nevi include the following benign nevi i uh, mean you know uh, they are not uh, that harmful they are just like a uh, growth uh, non harmful type of growth you can understand like that but if they are changing into early melanoma these are the points which will tell us about that so a is for asymmetry melanoma lesion are more likely to be asymmetrical okay than the benign nevi b is for border irregularity that means melanoma more likely to have irregular border whereas benign nevi has a very smooth type of border c is for color see this, this is a very important point melanoma are more likely to be very dark black or blue okay and to have variation in color than would a benign mole which more often is uniform in color and light tan or even brown so let me explain this once again uh, there is a bigger size mole there okay and half of that mole is very black in color and another half is relatively less black let's talk like that or even blue or even slightly red for example this is a very suspicious type of lesion okay and uh, if uh, that mole is really darker than the other ordinary one then also uh, this is a suspicious type of lesion that's the meaning and d is for diameter mole which are you know less than 6 mm in diameter are usually benign okay but uh, just now we have talked about if there are more than 50 number of uh, you know nevi and if uh, each of them is more than 2 mm then there is a chance for the future development of a melanoma both points are important there you know uh, we are not uh, talking about the individual one but here there are few nevi not more than 50 only few then 
if they are less than six millimeter, it is usually a benign one. Now let's see uh, some of the you know picture here. Look at this. See this. Look at the you know size here. Uh, there is a definite elevation, but this is like a superficial spreading type. You know, so this is a high uh, risk lesion. And if we do the biopsy, probably uh, this is a case of melanoma here. Another one is called lentigo maligna melanoma. Uh, of the right lower cheek in this patient. The centrally located iridematous papule represents invasive melanoma. This is the one, okay, right there. With surrounding macular lentigo maligna is melanoma in C2. This one. Probably it has invaded deeper, but here it has not invaded deeper. It is still in C2, means basement membrane has not been crossed. And the one, see this, this is a nodular type, okay, nodular type. Now, how to confirm the diagnosis of uh, melanoma? Let's talk about that. The diagnosis of melanoma is confirmed by excisional biopsy. And the whole, whole, you know, lesion is removed or biopsied, okay, excisional biopsy. A complete excisional biopsy is preferred the sample should have one to three millimeter of margin of healthy skin and should include all layers of the skin and some subcutaneous fat as well. This is to know how deep is the involvement. And one to three millimeter of the margin is taken. How wide is the involvement? Remember, there are two types of growth. One is called radial growth, another is called vertical growth. So we need to know both of those. That's why this type of excisional biopsy is taken. Other lab study are indicated according to the metastatic risk. If you suspect the metastasis, then only you go for those, you know. For example, if there is a stage four metastasis or stage four of the tumor or malignancy, then bone marrow is usually affected. Go for the CBC. If there is pancytopenia, you know, you know, bone marrow is already affected. If there is a metastasis to the liver or kidney, Okay, something like that, then go for liver function test and renal function test. Lactate dehydrogenase level is a very non specific type of enzyme analysis because if there is an increased tumor burden, lactate dehydrogenase enzyme will be higher. Protein and albumin level are some other types of tests, okay, and just to know what is the nutritional status of the patient. Just x ray, CT scan, and MRI are done for to know the staging, how, how far. The spread has occurred. Now, regarding the treatment of uh, melanoma, mm -hmm. surgery is the definitive treatment for early stage melanoma. Just like any other uh, type of skin cancer, surgery is the most important therapy here. Wide local excision with sentinel lymph node biopsy and or Elective lymph node dissection is considered the mainstay of treatment for patients with primary melanoma. So see there, it's a, this is a local excision with lymph node biopsy. Sentinel lymph node biopsy means till now, the lymph node is not enlarged or swollen, but still we need to take the biopsy from the lymph node just to rule out whether the lymph node metastasis has occurred or not. And if they are already swollen or increased, you know, then we have to definitely go for lymph node dissection. Another type of treatment is use of interferon alpha. Interferon alpha, type of interferon. And in the treatment of advanced stage melanoma, which is quite common in this condition. Remember, uh, out of the three skin cancer, melanoma is the most dangerous one, okay? The most malignant one. It can quickly metastasize to the other, other organ, especially the brain. Brain metastasis is very commonly seen in melanoma can be an important question in the MCV exam. So during uh, this type of condition, we can use chemotherapy like dacarbazine, interleukin-2, carboplatin, and, and paclitaxel, external beam irradiation. This is a type of radiation therapy. And even epilimumab, this is a monoclonal antibody type of therapy. So 
So these are the some advanced uh, type of treatment done for advanced cystic melanoma. Now, what is the prognosis? Okay, what is the prognosis of malignant melanoma? If uh, it is detected early, okay, if it is detected early, then melanoma can be cured with surgical excision. Okay, this is a wonderful point. Superficial spreading and nodular types are two most common and fatal type of melanoma. They are usually fatal, but these are more common than the other. Factors predicting the likelihood of response to the treatment include the following. So these are the good prognostic factors. Soft tissue disease or only a few visceral metastasis, age younger than 65, no prior chemotherapy, normal hepatic and renal function, normal complete blood count, and absence of CNS metastasis. All of these are good prognostic you know, factor or feature in the treatment of melanoma. Okay, patient respond better in this condition. Okay, so at the end, I like to request you all to like the video as much as possible, share it among your friends, and subscribe to the channel so that it will encourage me a lot for the future videos and recordings. Thank you so much.